All right. Welcome to everybody that's joining. We'll let people get settled in and then we'll get started in just a minute or two. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to uh, our January Campus Community Engagement Forum, co-sponsored by Accords and the CCTSI. Um, today's topic, today's actually the last in our series of um, understanding and appreciating the capacities of the community. And today we're going to be focusing on Pathways to Community Empowerment and Sustainability. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. We've got some great panelists with us um, with a lot of experience in this area. Um, I'm going to start off with just a, just a few introductory slides to um, sort of help frame some of the discussion here. Um, and uh, we'll launch in with those, and then I'll introduce our panelists, and um, we'll have time for them to speak. We'll have a little bit of time for um, you all to uh, uh, ask some questions, and um, then we'll close things out. All right, so um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. put this in presenter mode. There we go. All right. So sustaining and growing partnerships. So why is this a topic that we need to talk about? Um, you know, I think that uh, like any relationship, thinking about um, how to keep things going, how to keep the, the wheel turning, how to keep 
everything um, working smoothly is sometimes something that we don't always think about, uh, but it's really important. Uh, and particularly in work engaging with community partners, I think it's, it's critically important because like I've got here on the slide, um, things are changing all the time. Um, funding comes and goes. Uh, you know, you start up a project, um, you get some funding, um, that ends, what comes next? So that's a piece. Um, partners come and go. Um, you know, people change, uh, have need to come off a project for various reasons. Um, new things come up. So there are changes that happen there. And finally, the context of the work that um, surrounds or what surrounds our work oftentimes is in flux. And boy, have we seen that during COVID. Um, you know, things have been changing all the time. So those are, those are all, these things are always in flux with any partnership. But oftentimes the reason for partnering in the first place doesn't change. So, you know, the specific problems that you're focusing on might change. Um, opioids, COVID, food insecurity, you name it. But, you know, here, for example, um, we want to improve the health and well-being of recent immigrants to Northeast Colorado. That's that's something from from a group that we're working with in our in our seal work. Um, that's not likely to change. That's that's pretty constant. Um, and so how do we manage all this going forward? And I think it's useful to think about this in the context of the um, National Academy of Medicine framework that uh, came out or conceptual model to advance health equity through transformed systems for health. Um, if you're not familiar with this, I would encourage you to point your phone at that QR code. Um, that'll take you right to the report. Um, it's, a, it's a really well done document and this, this uh, figure of the conceptual model is really at the core. And you can see that um, community engagement and those core principles are right at the center um, with things that, that contribute to strengthen partnerships and alliances, leading on to expanded knowledge, going from there to improved health, healthcare programs and policies, and finally, um, the, the goal that I think we're all reaching for of, of thriving communities. Um, so it's good to kind of keep this in mind and I'm gonna focus this in on the, the, the center there of, of community engagement and those core principles um, that include trust, bidirectionality, inclusivity, being culturally centered with the community that you're working with, Equitable financing, really important. Um, Multi-knowledge, so recognizing that there's, there's different areas of expertise. Everybody's got something to bring to the table. Shared governance, um, so it's not, not all on one side or the other, but there's a shared governance structure. Um, there's an intent to, to keep working in an ongoing way. Um, and then finally, this notion of co-creation, that um, we're working at creating things together and we're co-equals uh, in the process of engaging folks. So with that as, as a context, you know, it's really important as you're starting your partnership um, so that things will be set up for sustainability to get really clear at the beginning. Why are we in this together? Um, what feeds our desire to keep working on this? Um, do we have agreement on what the core principles are um, around community engagement, but also the core principles of our work together? And, you know, one of the tricky points with language is always, you know, we, we can use words and have words in common and we can have language in common, but do we really have a common understanding of what those words mean? That's super important because it can be really dangerous if we make assumptions about what we mean when we're using a particular term like trust 
but we've not really unpacked that and we don't really have a shared understanding about what that means for us collectively. And then, you know, if you've done that work at the start, then I think it's important to regularly revisit that. And again, keeping, keeping these core principles in mind, um, are we still on the right track? Um, are there places where maybe we've gotten a little bit off track and we need to get better aligned? Um, how are we doing at maintaining our values and our trust? And are we talking about the hard stuff? Um, one of the things I always say is that uh, if you're having those difficult conversations with your community partners and they feel empowered to let you know where you're where you're maybe not quite on, on the same page, that is so important. And it's, it's a real marker of, of uh, reaching a level of trust that's very important. Um, and, you know, this last one, do, are we picking up the phone when the other person calls? Um, are we, that to me, I think has to do with what's the priority of this in, in the work that we're doing? And do we feel comfortable? So with those as introductory framing comments, I'm gonna stop my sharing, click out on my PowerPoint and introduce our panelists. So as I mentioned, we've got three really experienced and, and uh, I think gonna be very interesting panelists with us today. First, uh, I'm gonna introduce you to Don Hanna. Um, Don is the director of the PALS Children's Program uh, of La Puente in Alamosa. PALS stands for Positive Activities Lead to Success. Um, like many of us that do this work, he's got many hats. He's also pastor of the Alamosa Presbyterian Church, um, serves as chair of the SLB Community Advisory Board for the Rocky Mountain Prevention Research Center, which is gonna be some of the focus of today's conversation. Don's been in the Valley since 2013 um, and uh, lives in the house that his great, great grandfather built with his family. That's pretty cool. Um, and his family includes six goats, five dogs, four cats, three horses, two sheep, and a bunch of chickens and ducks. So there you go. So that's Don. Um, I'm next going to introduce Jamie Dominguez. Um, Jamie's somebody that uh, I've known for, for a bit. Um, had the pleasure of working with. Jamie grew up in the SLB, has been there his entire life. Um, Jamie uh, found his way into this work through um, discussions and, and work around um, mental, emotional, and behavioral health and ways to um, intervene early on with that. But um, he was working this territory even before that. He's uh, the current founder of the Shooting Stars Cultural and Leadership Center. Um, he's the president of the Five Star Writers Car Club, which uh, is, is kind of a stealth thing, um, car club that's actually involved in giving back to the community, which is really cool. Um, and that's been foundation for all of his work. Um, and like I said, anybody does this stuff, wears multiple hats, and Jamie's involved in a number of different projects. And then finally, uh, Jen Leiferman. Uh, Jen is chair of the Department of Community and Behavioral Health in the School of Public Health here on campus, directs the Rocky Mountain Prevention uh, Research Center, um, which is one of 25 CDC-funded prevention research centers around the country. And um, Jen is a champion for work in the community um, has done great stuff, has developed and evaluated interventions across all levels of the socio-ecological socio framework, um, and uh, is very interested in stuff around behavior change, change, social and environmental and structural supports. So that's our, that's our panel, and I'm going to start off with Don, who's going to give us an overview of PALS and how the partnership with Jen came about. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, 
I'll just start off with a little background on on PALS and what it is, and then kind of move into what happened with the the partnership that was formed. Um, PALS started about 25 years ago. It was 1997. Um, there was a in La Puente, which started off as a homeless shelter. Uh, another program formed off of that, um, which was Adelante. And when it started, it was transitional housing. It's morphed since then, but it was a transitional housing program. And one of the, uh, there's a long-term volunteer who was with Adelante. And she looked at one of the issues that these families were facing in that program. And that was that, you know, to, to move into more permanent housing, um, a big barrier or barrier for that was that um, you know they didn't health care. So started uh, basically babysitting for the families in the program, um, and that turned into PALS. Uh, one of the realities for the families that were in this transitional housing program was that you know a lot of the the kids had experienced a lot of traumas there was you know perhaps abuse going on at home and that's why they had left and gone to the shelter or you know, all sorts of things drug use um you know poverty was uh, like extreme poverty was pretty um across the board with with the families um and so uh, a reality for the, the kids was that they were uh, coming from places of trauma uh, and with that struggled from a lot of social emotional uh, issues, uh, really struggled at school, struggled with peers, struggled in their families. Um, and so that was the, the kids, the population, it was just a, a child care facility, but it was all these kids who who just had all these struggles. Um, the pr child protection in Alamosa kind of got wind, oh, you're working with these kids. And at um, some point about 10 years ago, we started a partnership with child protection. So um, they were referring kids to the program as well. PALS works with kids age five to nine. They're all referred in um, because of the, the traumas in their lives. Um, but so I started with with the program about five years ago, a little, little bit more now. Uh, one of the things that I came to see pretty quickly was that, you know, we were, we were working with these kids. We talked a lot about social emotional strengthening and that sort of thing. But we we had a lot of strength strengthening to do on our side to really be able to to work effectively with those um, kids and, and do what we were saying that we wanted to do, which was to build them up so that they they could really uh, thrive, um, you know, work past their their traumas and, and get back to a place where they, you know, they could integrate back into the classroom and in, into life in general, and, and like I said, thrive. Um, so we started looking at some, uh, you know, training. Uh, we started with trust-based relational intervention, which is an evidence-based program and working with kids with trauma. Um, but there was a lot of work still to go. Uh, that, that made a, an impact, and that was right around the time COVID hit. Um, I had been um asked to join the community advisory board for the rocky mountain prc uh it was right around i think just before before covid um and a grant came available um and jen who's uh the the chair of the rocky mountain prc uh had reached out to me saying i think this grant might fit with what you guys are doing really well um it's kind of a uh whirlwind of a turnover trying to get the the application in we found out about it just literally days before the application was due um but you know i've been thinking for a while about what we needed to strengthen the program um and so i ended up putting down thoughts uh into this grant proposal of of basically already what i was thinking would move us um move us forward and we we got the grant and so that was the start of the partnership and so um some of the things that we were able to do uh with that grant is we um, moved our program um to a, a place where we were really well first off we uh, were able to uh, purchase an, a social emotional assessment um that we do with all the kids once a month and you know it's showing where their strengths are in terms of their social emotional landscape and what their weaknesses really are. 
And so with that, we, you know, as a program, what we'll try to do is look at those, those strengths and really uh, play on those strengths, uh, you know, encourage those strengths, uh, comment th on the strengths saying, hey, you're doing awesome, L looking at the, the kids and saying, how can we use those strengths as a, a place of leadership? But then in a one-on-one -on -one way, we also look at the weaknesses and try to build those weaknesses up. And um, we have caseworkers in the program that, that work with each kid individually on their their weaknesses and we've seen uh, times where you know just really hammering on a weakness um opti I have a, a story of one kid who optimistic thinking was their weakness and we really just hammered on that over and over again and what we saw is across the board all of his social emotional uh areas raised up because of that another thing that we did is we did um we, you know looking at the family as a unit as a system uh, realized that working with the family was really important. We did started uh, parent phone calls or caregiver phone calls every week, but we also offered some uh, caregiver workshops, trying to build skills um, with the families. So you know, just a lot of them are coming from, you know, there's been generational trauma. Their their parenting may not be the, the strongest parenting, and they're just passing on Sort of the the habits and and ways of doing parenting that they received. So trying to break that cycle and, and work with the families as a whole. And another thing was that we uh, started a partnership with Children's Hospital, um, and the Rocky Mountain PRC was really instrumental in making that uh, connection happen. And we're still to this day working with Children's Hospital. The therapists there we did um, teletherapy. Uh, parent-child interactive therapy so we could do um, therapy with the whole family and helping families learn those skills um, almost bringing like a play therapy sort of approach to parenting um, and so we saw some pretty significant impact with that uh, <clears throat> since the grant has ended um, one of the um, pieces has that has gone away is those parent workshops um and that's um i guess in a in a way uh, we we learned a lot out of that grant cycle and that that partnership about what works and what doesn't work i would love to bring that piece back into pals but we learned a lot about um what doesn't work in workshops um and so uh that's you know kind of good that it ended but um i'm looking to bring it back in another way um and then the the one-on-ones uh we've kept that as a, a piece we're still doing the the assessments every single month and that's really helped shape how we work with the kids and look at the the whole group and work with the whole group as well um, and like i said the the partnership with children's hospital uh, has turned into not just the parent-child interactive therapy, but also a partnership with them where they're doing some consultation work with us, helping train our staff um, and really um, making us a stronger program. Uh, one of the things that you know was true in that partnership is that the grant cycle was for for one year. And so uh, you know at the end of that year, kind of it the the partnership officially ended. Um, the fact that I'm on the Rocky, the the cab for the Rocky Mountain PRC, and um, am now the the chair for that, uh, has meant that that partnership has unofficially continued on for for years since then, um, several years. And um, I find that uh, we're able to, um, you know, really able to to have that. Um, communication stay open there's been places where uh with jen i've been bounce ideas back and forth um with the the cab and one of the things that i've felt that has been valuable in my end of the partnership is uh, like i feel like i poke holes a lot um in like oh let's try this uh sort of thing and i'm always saying well with the population that i'm working with which tends to be people in in pretty extreme poverty who have those traumas um you know things will will uh, I'll, I'll point out how something won't. I guess that's uh, maybe annoying, but also valuable. Um, and I guess I'll leave it there. I know my time is coming close to an end here. Um, so I will pass it on to, to Jamie. 
Thank you, Don. Uh, Jamie, I'll let you take it from there. Thank you, Don. A lot of um, good information. I, I was aware of PALS, but the, the how the work continues to grow is just awesome. Um, my 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 community engagement experience with Rocky Mountain PRC is, is awesome because they invite me to give my feedback from a community perspective that's on its way to an academic um, setting. Um, Shooting Stars Cultural Leadership Center was founded by me and my wife and our car club members. And it's been a 10 year project that it's taken us this long to get into a space where we are invited to important forums like this and alongside um, grant meetings too, where the money should go. They take our input and for us and from community perspectives, this is huge because Growing up in a small rural community and seeing the problems and living them and having them in your family and friends and just seeing them all around and always thinking as you're growing up that they, that you can't be a part of how to fix or utilize um, resources for this stuff um, has been big for Shooting Stars. Um, we realize now working alongside of some of the academic um, institutions and universities and research groups that they really care about what's going on in our town, even if they're not from there. So that's huge for us. And we we try to to get on board with everything we can and give our opinion, because a lot of these opinions are, I think, are spread across the state, that they're similar. And for us to have a community voice, um, people like Jen and the, and the University of Denver give us the, the opportunity to talk about what we see from a grassroots perspective. Um, Jen has and her group have invited me to uh, multiple meetings and they have been um, powerful for me because I, I just keep getting reassurance that what we're doing and what we see and what we have to offer is just as um, credible and strong as any other research that goes on um, in, in the state of Colorado and across the nation that, that helps us address any health equity systems um youth emotional behavior adult behavior and and that kind of stuff for me is huge because me growing up i always thought that i couldn't be a part of anything bigger than what i was taught or what i saw without education um i never went to college but i know my lived experience has just as much power as as any degree i can earn and i really own that from a community and a nonprofit space that we've created in our small town of Alamosa. Um, we feel like we can culturally identify with populations that we do serve um, in our town, not speaking everywhere across the state, but I'm sure our framework can be adjusted and jive with a lot of um, stuff that we do in our programs and in our, our institution that we now have a building. We, we've grown so much in the past two years with the help of researchers, grantors, um, people letting us just come and fill their space has given us the resources to grow. And we never ever thought three years ago we would be in the space we are now if it wasn't for the help of academic resources that have stepped in and asked um, if we would give them grace to work alongside of us. So it's huge for, for me to understand how academic roles could be played in community spaces and how community um, grassroots organizations can benefit academics too, because it, it's very important for us to have a partnership because we can't, we can't hash out and solve everything without the help of an academic um, partner. And I feel pretty sure it's the same way um, from their perspective. Um, I'll let Jan um, fill in a little bit on, on how she's, coming to our community and helped us alongside with them, um, helping Don's group too. So thank you guys. Thanks, Jamie and Don. Well, I get the pleasure of working with these fantastic people, uh, which is highlight of my job, 100%. Um, our, our Rocky Mountain Prevention Research Center, like uh, Don Neese said at the beginning, um, it's, it's funded by the CDC and it's, it's really funded in a true academic community partnership. And we have been blessed to have um, really strong partnerships with the San Luis Valley for almost two decades, actually a little bit over. I think it started in 1998 um, with uh, Julie Marshall's leadership. And um, the, the fantastic thing is thinking over two decades, we've been doing this work. And, and I think it's really embraced now in the scientific community, but a few decades ago, uh, pioneering. 
And what we notice overall of the time in doing academic community partnerships is what Jamie was just, you know, uh, touching on is just the sustainability. You know, we to do real meaningful work that can be sustained in communities, you have to partner with uh, the community on all aspects. And it's just a true uh, marrying of resources, the community knowing uh, their community the best and what works uh, best for them. And then academia helping to um, identify evidence-based programming and, and perhaps uh, bolster evaluation efforts um, and bring um, some of the, the research methodology um, to the process, you know, just strengthens the, the rigor of the programming and then the likelihood of sustainability. And um, with our Rocky Mountain Prevention Research Center, we have a community advisory board. And we've had folks on our community advisory board for a long, long time. And in fact, I was the intervention core director in 2005. And some of those folks are still on the board when I returned uh, four years ago. So that's just fantastic. So there's so much commitment um, to the work that we're doing. And it is um, founded on uh, the bedrock of trust and reciprocity, like Don uh, mentioned earlier. And, and so when we plan projects, we think of the community from the beginning. And we're right now in a year four of a, a funded project that the community spent a year thinking about what are the needs. And it came out that adverse childhood experiences uh, was a priority need that the community really wanted to address. And so in developing our five-year project, we worked with the community um, after that year of learning, just to identify, you know, what resources were happening, were already occurring in the valley. Um, could we leverage extant resources because we don't want to burden the community anymore? Um, and and then how can we come together and develop a, a project that has great likelihood for sustainability? And all of that means a lot of time and commitment and and meetings. Um, and so I liked uh, Don's, you know, um, mention of co-creation because it's so true. I mean, we sit down and we try to explore what are we going to be doing with our projects. And so our, our five-year grant is ending here in a year. And Jamie had mentioned how we have been inviting folks to our community advisory board. And under Don's leadership for our CAB, we have been spending months trying to understand where would we like to go with the next five-year grant. And it is really completely community informed. Um, so we have been meeting with folks uh, from all over the Valley and, and trying to better understand where we'll move um, next year. And when you tell that to some researchers, they might be like, oh my gosh, like a months and months of planning, um, you know, to do the work. And then once you, get the grant, there's just so much um, collaboration through it. It's such an iterative process. It's fascinating. It's gray. You have to be a little patient and flexible in um, navigating all of the changes uh, you know, that occur. But at the end, and I can speak for our grant right now as we're entering our fifth year and we're looking at sustainability, we are so thankful uh, when we get together with this academic community partnership that we put all that time in up front because the buy-in was there for the project as we think about um, moving it into the next phase of sustainability where the, the resources will go away. So when Don Hanna was you know, sharing how we brought these monies in and to provide um, support for these programming changes for PALS, we also brought uh, fun funding in for evaluation. So then that PALS could go for more competitive funding in the future, you know, to showcase all the amazing work they're doing. And it, it's really awesome from my perspective to hear Don share how they're, they've sustained pieces and some pieces, maybe not, but even if they weren't sustained, they learned from them and how they might want to do it differently in the future. And, and so I think that that just really highlights the iterative process and the reciprocity between academia and the community and how we, we really try to um, enhance the likelihood of communities thriving you know, together um, in a shared space. Yeah. 
video and muting <laughs> got there. Um, thank you so much, Jen and Jamie, for for your um, summaries of your work as well. Um, I am hoping maybe all three of you can talk a little bit about how you decided this was the right fit, that this was something worth sustaining and continuing to work on and partner together. Um, and maybe we can just go in the same order a little bit about for your thought process on how you decide to sustain this work. And so John, maybe you, you can jump in first. I guess, you know, one of the things that I've realized is that working with an academic institution whose focus is research, um, it's kind of changed a little bit how I even think of the program. Like, I don't necessarily see it as just, um, you know, we're not just taking care of kids. Like, I, I think of it almost as a, a an ongoing research project where we're always trying to figure out what works, figure out what doesn't work, and, you know, just continually improve and improve, um, you know, for the for the kids. Um, and so I think that's that that is one of the pieces that has kept me in the cab and kept the the relationship um, going forward is that, you know, I, I really do valuable or value the uh, the connection and just kind of the the mindset that uh, we have with a, an academic partner um, helps me keep things framed in that way and, and think in those those terms. Okay. How about you, Jamie? Um, when I when I started working in this space, um, like I said before, it was a space I didn't understand, but I understood why the work needed to be done. Um, the choice that I made was that systems involved in a lot of the work that a lot of people do across this, the, the nation and states across the United States is there's are systems involved that um, I don't think they understand what cultural relevation um, means to a community. Um, a lot of ACEs, diverse childhood um, experiences and kids are based off the culture they live in and how they grow up. So for me to do my work, I felt like it was my job to make sure that a lot of academic spaces and people, researchers who are asking very important questions that I be real and, and straightforward with why certain communities are in spaces, are there in them spaces uh, and why we need to do this work and why it's so important. So I just, I felt there was a, a, a space for, for me and my team and our organization to make sure that when we are doing this work, and talking about future um, allocations of funds, resources, um, a lot of important stuff that we make sure that we're represented in in a way that we identify ourselves as, whether we're Hispanic, um, populations of color, any African American. In this realm, where I feel there's not enough um, representation from us as leaders, I mean we're working on growing, but I feel that's why it's so important and and why we continue to do our work. And I'm thankful for organizations like like, like Jan's and, and your guys's who listen to what we really feel and what we see to contribute to solving these problems that we have in our community, in our families, and in our youth. How about you, Jen? Yeah, um, you know, so the question was on sustainability, right? Yeah, um, and how do you decide when when to sustain, when who to partner with, and and approach in a, a more long term way? Yeah, I you know I think what we've really learned in this current five year project, um, you know, that we're we're in the middle of the fourth year on is the value of that upfront discussion about what is this gonna look like when the dollars leave? And having that kind of frank conversation with the stakeholders in the community um, and the buy-in is just essential. And here's an example. So our projects on preventing, uh, and this is a, a tall order, the intergenerational transmission of adverse childhood experiences and we knew we wanted to do early intervention with kiddos, uh, you know, five and under. And we wanted to identify a place where we could reach all of them. Well, the Early Childhood Council in the Valley, they were a champion from the beginning on this um, and um, sat on our community advisory board. 
literally sat with us to write pieces of the grant. And and why that's important is because we identified early on with our community advisory board that early child education centers would be a, a great hub for us to do our work. And the early childhood council um, manages that, you know, manages the training and, and how those uh, early education childhood centers, uh, you know, work. And so having the stakeholder buy in from the beginning to help us think through what are those resources currently available and how can these potential monies we could bring in help? And then what would we do when those monies leave to sustain this new intervention that's aimed to enhance social emotional development in little kiddos within the centers? And so in doing that and thinking up front from the beginning how we're gonna do it, now as we're getting ready to transition into year five, we're pulling some of those FTEs away, right? They're going to be leaving, but the council, because they had bought in originally to this idea and it was so in line with their mission and they were very passionate about seeing these changes, um, we're working now to like write into job descriptions to absorb these lost FTEs to continue the work in a sustainable way when the center dollars go away for this project. And that's just like one example where I feel like it's super valuable to be thinking about that up front because the resources often drive the programming and the implementation and the sustainability. Um, and it also helps us think through um, at the end of a grant period, like Don was uh, highlighting, there's some pieces that were found to be very valuable and wanting to be sustained. And there's other pieces that maybe, well, maybe the intent was great uh, and we thought they were going to work really well, but it ended up not, you know, really um, having the impact uh, that the community wanted. And so sometimes pieces go away and that's okay because we learn either way and, um, you know, and then move forward in, in whatever way we need to from that knowledge. Jen, you started to talk about this a little bit, um, but we got a question um, from somebody who registered uh, as part of their, you know, here's what I'm hoping that they'll talk about a little bit around the structures that are needed to sustain these partnerships as funding changes or context changes. I think we've talked a lot about relationships and trust, but what are some of the, the actual structures that you have in place? Um, and the questions to all of you, not just Jen, um, the, but the structures that really help to sustain this and continue the, the partnerships that you have um, over time. Don, Jamie, I have some thoughts. Do you want me to go or would you, do you want to go? Um, I, I can go first. Um, some of the things that we've learned is we've looking at, we're starting to look at it as two sides of the work. So when we first started our philanthropy and we started moving into community engagement and, and doing the work, there's a whole other side of sustainability, building capacity, um, trainings, and, and, and understanding that it takes a lot more than just doing the work to stick to stick around. And I'm sure Don knows firsthand about what this feels like when you go and you get a grant and you're motivated and you start doing the work and then all of a sudden it, it ends and it's like, whoa, there's a piece that, I, that I'm not ready for. So with us, just the help of people inviting us and finding resources like Jen found for Dawn and, and, and to help better programs. And I have a bunch of stakeholders and grantors that are working alongside our institution now and, and, and sitting in this space with us, just knowing that there's more to the work than just the work and being there with you on that journey and explaining to you, okay, um, you know, about sustainability, building capacity, um, penciling salaries, making sure the jobs are there for people and the impact and evaluation teams are there to measure your success. So a, a lot of that stuff we are learning alongside with just doing the work, which is still full time and hard. So um, sustainability and capacity is huge for us. And it's a whole nother learning process alongside doing the work at, and why we showed up anyway. Go ahead, Jen. Okay. okay, I didn't know, Don, if you wanted to jump in. Um, yeah, you know, 
I, I think what our, our center tries to do is play a role of facilitator. And, and we are able to do that because of monies provided from our sponsors, right? Um, to create spaces that folks can come together to share knowledge, to identify where they'd like to move forward, um, to convene with food and fellowship, right? And, and I think that that's really an, an important piece. It's just that infrastructure to provide space to continue to have conversations. Um, and I think that when um, grants are limited with a certain amount of time and they, they come and go, that having that continuity is really important. And I think when we think about um, some coalitions like within our center, um, making sure that there's buy-in from um, all of the organizations and that leadership kind of bounces around from folks like the different organizations um, that are committed to the change. I think those are a couple of things that they seem pretty straightforward, but I, I think they're key to be able to continue to do successful work. How about you, Don? What, what are some of the structures that need to be in place to, to sustain this as other things change? Um, I guess, you know, maybe this is just putting what Jen said in, a, in another way, but, you know, just the fact that there, there is the, the Rocky Mountain PRC that it exists as a structure. Sorry, I've got sirens going on here. Um, with a monthly meeting uh, where, you know, it it kind of forces the conversation to continue. So the, just the fact that it exists as a thing and that uh, we're in continued dialogue is um, I think super critical to that ongoing conversation and relationship. You know, the other piece that kind of like came out of the, the grant cycle was that, the you know we learned how to tell our story and to look at what we were doing in a way with with numbers and that was you know, you know there's qualitative uh, information that we can give you know to other funders who are coming in to you know look at the program we can say look you know during that time we we there are one on ones we are doing a lot of data tracking with all that and we saw that like all of um you know, across the board, all the kids, their numbers went up. Um, some of them not super high, but across the board, it went up and, and goals were able to be changed and that sort of thing. And the fact that we know how to do that, you know, the fact that they they helped us walk through the process of showing that data, um, you know, that's meant that we can take that to other funders and say, look, you know, and so that's, that's helped um, just with other funds coming in. So, you know, having that piece has been really important. That's great. We have a question from one of our attendees right now. Um, could you guys talk more about how your work has been co-created? What has that process looked like? Um, again, Jen, you mentioned a little bit about like sitting and writing together, but what are some of the other ways that you've really co-created the work that you've done? And any of you can jump in. Um, I, I would love to get Don and Jamie's take on this, but right now, you know, as we're planning our next five-year grant, it is coming from the community. Um, and it has been a, what would you say, Don, a, a, a curvy road. We've been trying to figure out, you know, where are we going to go with this next five-year grant? And um, the co-creation of this grant uh, in the writing of it coming down the pipeline sooner than we probably want it to here in a couple of months um, is really, it's a blend of the two, you know, academia and community coming together with a lot of, of conversation to listen to what's, um, what's on the mind of the community and then also being responsive to what the sponsor may be asking of us to do. And it's just, coming, you know, so like we know where our expertise is in the center and we are listening to the community where their needs are. And then it's identifying that sweet spot between what we're hearing from the community that's important to them and that um, the community would like to, to spend time on uh, addressing and then making sure that we have the expertise in-house to really 
um, work together to provide a competitive application. And that's um, that takes a lot of back and forth and a lot of um, a lot of conversation and trying to figure out like where are we going to intervene, who are we going to intervene, what are we going to actually do. And, and Jamie and Don have been in on those conversations in the last months, and um, they'll continue for the upcoming months. Um, Dame, Jamie, Don, thoughts on just that process on co-creating what we're, what we're going to do? Um, I guess, you know, one of the things that popped into my head is just uh, the, the process really had, like, in some ways, it's like going out into to, to map. A, an entirely blank field or something. Um, and so it's like, you're walking out and there's all these questions about what are what are we gonna do? Um, and what I've seen is that uh, there's different questions uh, from the community side and from the academic side. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the things on um, coming, coming from the academic side, like it, it feels like there's this real urge to like just know like what you know what does this field look like let's let's figure it out um and you know the the prc has been really good at at um kind of tapping the brakes um and and letting the community just really sit with the the questions and so you know it's been this month's process of a lot of times you know, it's, it takes like, we're, we're talking, we're talking, we're talking, and then it takes looking back and going, oh, well, we've actually made some progress uh, in, in this process. And um, you, you don't, it, it's almost frustrating sometimes um, to, to be in that place, because it, it feels almost like you're spinning your wheels. But um, it is that that hindsight where you look back and go like, oh, we've, we've gone a really long distance here um, and we're, we are figuring it out so you know I think just having uh, that encouragement from from the PRC where they've gone through it before and kind of know um, know how how the timeline unfolds um, but then just the the questions from both sides um, and that has led us in a different place than probably if either one had said well let's let's do a project you know Jamie, anything to add? Um, yeah, it, it's interesting how Don says spinning your wheels. So with an academic question and a community trying to present an answer or working alongside of them, it sometimes I feel like the brakes do need to be pumped because community isn't used to even answering their own questions sometimes. So to for for our work that we do, we do a lot of community assessments. We have evaluation teams. We have data analysis that we that we use to hash out all the data to make sure it's strong and that we know how to represent community as best as we can, even when community has a hard time answering questions that we usually bombard them with, with surveys or meetings in public spaces. So for us to work together like that and, and, and take the time and understand, okay, maybe the question that you're asking is really this kind of an ask and and but we're all getting to wanting to get to the same answer so it is very harmonious in how we work at understanding what we're really getting at in the work so i i really appreciate the fact that some academic institutions are looking into to helping us um community but sometimes we need to slow down and say okay even down to one serious question what does this question really look like from this perspective like don said and, and then um finding a, a space to 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 hash that out and go back to the work based around what we're what we're working on. You know, if I could pop in with one other thought really quick, um, I guess another piece that has been really good that I've seen is that um, you know there's just this breadth of knowledge of you know other projects that exist out there, other you know, evidence based things that could be implemented you know and, and a lot of times the community is like oh like what uh you know they have the the idea of something they want to try and and you know jen being able to say well there's this uh paper that was written on this and this project that's existed like what would it look like here um and you know the the implementation piece probably looks very different 
in any community. And so then the, the community side can start thinking about that, but just having you know, the fact that we're, we're not reinventing a wheel, um, that, that there's things that we can draw on and, and Jin and the PRC having that, that breadth of knowledge has been really good too. That's great. Before we wrap up in two sentences, what advice would you give to um, a new partnership? How to think about long-term sustainability? What's your sort of summed up advice for them? Um, Jamie, do you want to go first? My two cents would be to be patient and understand how everything works in, in, in both the academic and the community side. Because if you let frustration get in the way of not knowing one or the other, then it 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 hinders sustainability and um, capacity building. So patience is key and trusting each other. How about you, Jen? Yeah, I, I did know what Jamie says. I'll add, in addition, um, I think commitment is another piece. 